Yeah, hello, I'm Rob Danford. I work at the University of Oxford in the Environmental <coughs> Change Institute. Um, it's not just my work we're presenting today, there's quite a lot of us on the team, Pam and Smith have been involved, um, Alison Smith and uh, a number of others, uh, as well as Louise Marlin from um, the Environment Bank, who was very helpful, particularly, so she knows a lot more of you than I do and did a great job helping us to get in touch. So, um, what are we doing here? We're talking about ecosystem services and what they're like in Warwickshire. Uh, Coventry and Solidar, which I call Warwickshire Plus further down. Stop me having to say all three of them because it gets to be a bit of a mouthful. Um, just a quick recap of what ecosystem services are. They're essentially, it's what nature does for us. It's the things that nature gives to people. I'm sure a lot of you will know this, but I thought I'd do a quick recap at the beginning because I don't know the terms. It's, I'm not sure how helpful they are. We've sort of broken it down to three broad classes in this presentation, although there are other ways of breaking it down. Provisioning services, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's the things that nature is, it's the stuff, it's the food, the wood, the water, um, that kind of thing that we get from nature for free. Um, then there's regulating services, which are kind of the functions of the ecosystem, the things that, um, the, the natural systems that are in place that contribute to our continued existence. So, you know, holding the soil together, keeping the air clean, that kind of stuff. And then on top of those, there are cultural services, which are the kind of the bits where it really matters to, to our hearts and minds. So they're kind of um, like we go out and play in nature, we go and climb a tree, we think it's pretty. Um, we have places that wouldn't be the same if they hadn't got nature around them. So those are the kind of the cultural services. So that's my quick introduction to what I'm sort of talking about. It's those, those three kind of broad areas of services uh, provided by nature. And they're important because they put a much broader focus on what nature does. So a, t um, a forest isn't just your managed timber reserve anymore. It's not, you know, how much stock of tree can I get from it? It's also, gosh, that tree is actually stopping our climate from going wrong. Um, it's also somewhere I can take my kids and, uh, and get them to experience what nature's like. So it's, it's that getting that broader view of what nature can do. So that's one of the reasons I think it's important. The second thing, uh, that's important about it is, of course, it's got a lot of traction in policy at the moment. The whole natural capital agenda, ecosystem services with their kind of service end, the idea that you can, you know, sort of stop quantifying and costing it so that you can kind of put it into arguments better. But, you know, it's, it's something that people can latch on to more. So that's why we're looking at them. That's what we're doing. The reason I'm standing here today is because uh, there's an EU funded project called Openness. Uh, that is looking at how the ecosystem concept work, ecosystem service concept works in practice. So does it actually do anything helpful for people who are managing the environment, people who are working with uh, real issues in which you're deciding whether you want to develop something or not, or you're deciding how to manage something uh, in the natural world? Like, does it actually help? Like, how, do, how does it help in practice? The projects, we're sort of getting towards the end of it now, it finishes so early next year. And so there were 27 case studies uh, across Europe and the world. In fact, there's, you know, there's some in Africa, India, two in South America, but as you can see, dotted around Europe. <coughs> and what we're particularly interested in is um, looking at different ways of assessing ecosystem services and seeing which methods for understanding what the environment does work in which contexts. So in some situations, if you're looking at uh, cultural ecosystem services, for example, um, you want to know um, where people go for aesthetic beauty. We've got a couple of methods here that we've looked at where we look at uh, photos taken on Flickr. So we've downloaded all the photos in Warwickshire that are, the, the, the downloaded all of the photos in Warwickshire, full stop. Then we started to filter through them to identify those that have natural stuff in them. I'll talk about it in a bit anyway. Um, and we also had uh, participatory, participatory workshops. Some of you have the pleasure of being in those. Uh, where we sit around with some maps and we talk about what your system services are where, where you'd like them to be in the future, that kind of thing. So they're useful at getting a, a different kind of side of things. But of course we're here to celebrate the HBA today and the first thing that we noticed when we came here and we started talking about how we would do um, methods to help you guys understand what ecosystem services you had, it became ridiculously apparent within the first meeting just how phenomenal 
the HAB, HBA is as a resource for, because I mean, ecosystem services come from land use. They, they come from different levels of management of that land use, but at the baseline, it's what kind of, what kind of natural world you've got. And knowing what kind of natural world you've got, using something like the HEA, it's just it's phenomenal. So that, that's why I think we'll highlight a bit there, because I mean, that was, the, that was the obvious thing when we first got here. Um, and it was clear we had to make use of it. So I'm going to talk you through the three methods we use, which are on the last slide. This is the first one. We basically start with the HBA as the baseline. And then we need to look at ways of linking uh, the land uses from the HBA through to ecosystem services that are provided. And there is a very simple illustrative, illustrative approach that is being used relatively widespread across Europe as a first step at your understanding of what, what kind of ecosystem services you've got. So where your area is, where the, the natural world is regulating your environment are, where the areas where you're providing the most resources are, that kind of thing. And what we needed to do was find a way of customising that approach for Warwick Chain. So we needed to have, uh, to develop something to link the capacity of uh, an actual, a bit of the natural world, like a forest, to the amount of service it would provide. And for the people who were in that meeting, where we had some lovely planners and some lovely ecologists, who we planned on it to be really in, 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 interactive and exciting, but it turned out that actually really what we were just doing to do was fill in an Excel spreadsheet where we had basically this, uh, where you have uh, your types of uh, land use on one side and the extent to which it provides an ecosystem service on another and class it from zero to five. And then, exactly, so we worked around the table of uh, the people, they filled in the, the, the sheets um, and we took it away and we came up with a summary of it. And then it really is very simple but you end up with things like forests coming out with high levels um, of lots of the different services and areas where you've got urban are, are not great at producing crops. It's not rocket science, but it actually, if you link that through to the HBA, you quite quickly get to a position where you've got maps. But before I did that, I thought these are, these are Chris's diagrams and I find them really, really good. So this is, um, this is, uh, the, this is just the raw output from that meeting in terms of um, what level of service was provided by the different types of land use. And they're really good for illustrative, so woodlands. They're great for the green ring here is the cultural services, the blue ring is the regulating services, and the red ring is provisioning services. And, you know, orchards have more provisioning services than the other types of woodland because they're producing timber and food, or they're producing timber or food. They're, they're all very high in terms of their ability to regulate, and they're all very high in terms of their importance to people. Look at grasslands. Immunity grasslands are not as strong in terms of uh, their regulating services as your unimproved natural grasslands are. And again, they're not as important to people as your unimproved natural grasslands are. Bearing in mind you've got a lot of ecologists coming up with the numbers here. But it's important, no, it's important to think where the numbers come from, but it's also a very good thing to flag just the basic differences between land uses in terms of things they do. Um, wetlands here, high um, amount of regulated uh, cultural services for um, running and standing waters, people like rivers and streams, and ponds and lakes. More um, regulating services from your marshy grasslands, swamps, and uh, wet woodlands. So these are, I mean, these, these are Chris's diagrams, and I think they're really good at just getting across the idea of why they, they give the right sort of messages. You're getting the, you're getting the right kind of feel for the things uh, that are valuable in different ways. But that's just the first stage. You then basically apply that to the habitat data, and all we're doing here is colouring in the, um, the different land use classes by the level of value you've got. And this is a, a summary for all regulating services. You could have this for an individual regulating service, you could have it for um, uh, flood water prevention or soil re uh, regulation, and you get a different map. This is an average of all of the uh, regulating services. But it quickly, you can flag up the you can give your forests and your, your wooded areas, flag up different to the arable areas around them. And I mean, it might not have a rocket science, but according to David, it's useful. So this is, this, is the, this is the thing, like provisioning services. Here you're seeing your areas of food production. 
flagged up really loudly, um, but also timber's a provisioning service too, so that'll be flagged up too. Cultural services. Um, again, your woods are coming out strong because they, prefer, uh, they provide both cultural services as well as the regulating services. And you could do an overlay map of all of them, and then you can start seeing where are the places that you're getting mixed benefits from things. So that's the advantage of woods. They provide you know, regulating services, provisioning services, and cultural services. But it's not just woods, of course, like weapons and, um, and the, the grasslands do a similar thing. So that's, that's, that's where we got to on that one. I'll do a bit of discussion at the end about how useful it is, because I'll, I'll tie that back in like, through all the three methods. Um, We've also looked at this flicker stuff that I was talking about. It's probably better if I just go straight into the diagrams, because basically what Alison, who's not here today, spent her time doing is going through these large number of photos on a web application and picking out the photos that had nature in them, which is a ridiculously high proportion, actually, in Warwickshire, because a lot of the things that people bother to take photos of are pretty natural things. And then we can just divide them up into classes uh, that recognise the types of ecosystem services you're seeing that are coming from workshops places. So there's lots of it's landscape type stuff. There's you know lots of beautiful views, lots of lots of pretty lakes. I mean, I haven't got any canals in here, which is ridiculous because canals are flagged up massively in Warwickshire. Recreation. There's photos of people feeding <coughs> ducks with their children. There's photos of people running along and doing whatever they're doing with sheep. It's no, but it's great because you can see the sort of things that people value. They value it enough to take a photo of it. They value it enough to then plot that photo on the web. I don't understand it, but people do it. And it's great because it gives us a resource and it gets us to see yeah, what things people value. Species. Lots of lovely species. There's hundreds of photos taken by, um, taken by people of, of, of ridiculous... Of, I mean, these are really nice photos of closely detailed ones, but the number of the photos of ducks and like, no, but people love it. And there are things that obviously it's really, it's really getting, a, getting through to people. And it's quite nice that we can see uh, the sort of things that people are valuing in Warwickshire. Of course, the advantage of this is they're all spatially referenced. So we know where they took the photos. We can also then classify the photos in terms of whether they're landscape photos, whether they're species photos, whether they're recreation photos, and start flagging the sort of things that come up where. So that you can... You can, you can see what's going on. And then you can start looking at um, whether or not, you know, you've got random marsh here, lots of dots, but there's not so many dots in these bits. And you can start asking questions of yourself. So why are some areas getting more photos taken than uploaded? Is it the people that are going there? Could be the people that are going there. Could be that you've got a load of Flickr uploaders around, around the marsh, but not around there. But it could also be something to do with access or something to do with the, the level of uh, how well looked after the, the scientists, that kind of thing. So there's, there's, there's lots of things to explore there. It's quite a fun approach because you can, you can get a, a bit of ecosystem services you wouldn't get at in another way. That sort of makes sense. But I mean, what we've started to think about now is what are the limitations of the method in terms of working out. Um, you don't get many photos of people running except in organised events. Because if you're running, you're probably not taking a photo. You know, so it, it, it underrepresents some things and it over-represents others. So you do get hundreds of photos of an organised running event. But you don't get photos of people necessarily walking their dog, because they may well have been walking their dog here, but they're not taking photos necessarily of the dog. And besides, if they did, how would I tell if that dog was their dog or just a dog? Um, do you see what I mean? So there, there, are, there are things that are represented more and things that are represented less. So yeah, we're currently starting to look into applying sort of more broad scale data sets on this. So looking at how much these relate to things like the past and that sort of thing, so that you can see if access is an issue, if, a, if there is a difference in access between here and here. I'm not great on where things are in Warwickshire, so if that happens to be your back garden or something, I'm sorry, but, but if, if the, that's the question, is like, what are the factors that are driving it? The third method that we trialled in Oxfordshire, uh, where we are, Warwickshire, was participatory workshops. So I get the feeling that most people have been dragged to something like this before, where you're given a map of an area and you sit with other sticky dots or uh, post-its and somebody facilitates and you talk through what ecosystems are, what, what, what something is important in this area. So we did this, we ran two different uh, sessions, one with um, rural land use people, so farmers and agricultural related people, and then one with planners and ecologists, just to see if there was a difference in the, the sort of places they flagged out. There were some differences, but not massively. And we worked in a Warwickshire scale, and we talked through 
six of the existing services that we'd highlighted as being important. So we looked at traditional farming and intensive farming. And we looked at uh, habitat for wildlife. We looked at uh, flood regulation and we looked at where people found aesthetically beautiful and where people went for recreation. So, you know, it's a different approach to the more quantitative HPA based approach, but you get stuff that you wouldn't get through the others. So, like I said, the purpose of this project is to look at which methods work where, what things you get from one that you don't get from another, and how you can combine them in a way that you can get a more holistic picture of what's going on in a holistic issue, which is um, the combined provision of services from the natural world. So these are the sort of outputs you get, the lots of dots. We talked to them about um, not only where it was good at providing it now, but where they would like uh, the provision to be in the future. So you can do some future exploration stuff. Um, you can talk about what areas needed to be restored, so we can go back to. And my colleague Alison, Alison has done an incredible job of uh, summarising that into a GIS and overlaying it with some um, uh, pamphlet -y thingy jobs at the back that summarise this. Um, but on this side, so this is the supply of ecosystem services. Now, in this case, aesthetic beauty, these were the areas that the stakeholders ringed. Apologies to people in this area, but I'm sure they're asked too. But then these were the areas that they focused as being places that they could thought that you could improve ecosystem service provision in terms of aesthetic beauty. Again, their opinion maps, they're based on a small number of people, but they do, what we're trying to show is that there are different ways of accessing these things, and that you can get at different information using different approaches. Uh, so that's aesthetic beauty, we do one for habitat for wildlife, um, got the impression there's quite a broad, uh, we're doing well on wildlife in terms of the ability to a lot there, but that there's a lot of space to improve in a number of areas, particularly um, in terms of joining things up. And that's another thing that you can't see on the maps, but one of the advantages of this approach is you get a lot of stories out of this. So people tell you their, their actual um, their feelings about things and you get a much broader view of things that are going. It's not quantitative, it's, it's very much more story-based. Um, we ran this also in Essex and we did one looking at special places. So places that mean something to you. And it, that's really interesting because you get a very different feel for kind of the, the sense of change and the sense of loss and the sense of gain and that, that comes through that can actually help to make a really strong argument because th this is what it's about. We're trying to argue for nature. So we're trying to find different ways of making different arguments. And uh, this is quite a useful way of getting stories out of people, stories that help arguments be made. Uh, and that's one for recreation. So um, that, I mean, have a quick look at the report. Alison's done a reasonable, a good summary of um, of the outputs that come from this, along with the stories that are in there. But uh, it's just, at this moment, it's just to illustrate the sort of things you can do. So the next steps in Warwickshire Plus, um, with the Habitat uh, GIS stuff, the advantage of it with that matrix is that it's quite transparent. It's, um, you know that an area is a forest, you know that it's been given a five because it's on the matrix as a five. Uh, so the space to adjust those scores, um, there's the space to include other land use classes as they come along, so, um, and to include the hedgerows. Um, you can update it with the latest phase one, um, but you can also start including additional data sets. Like, it's very much the first step, but if we've got information on what forests are in good condition versus the forests that are in bad condition, we can add that in and start changing their scores. So it's, it, you know, and it can build. The more time you spend on it, you can build it and you can follow that argument through so that when you're trying to explain to somebody why that area is important, why it's flagged up as a higher colour than another, you can say, well, it was that colour, but actually we spent a lot of time improving it and now it's this. The flipper stuff, um, we have just about analysed and we're about to apply, like I said, to look at it with additional data sets to start explaining why it's <coughs> taken in one area rather than another. Um, so we're currently doing that. and. The participatory workshop, participatory workshop stuff is written up and available at the back. So that's that. And in terms of openness, so as I said, the purpose of the project is to see where these methods work in practice. So I know where I like the methods, but we sent out some questionnaires to both, this was done with a sister project in Essex, but also with the 27 case studies across Europe. And they've all been asked the questions about the same methods using a standard template. So we have a questionnaire of which I've got some responses, 
And that's gone into a central place somewhere to be analysed by something other than me because I'm not allowed to see it because I'm allowed to get offended. And so we will find out at the end and use that to provide guidance to say, okay, well, people find this method is great in principle, but it doesn't work for this, this and this. And then we can put that in some guidance that we can use to help other people who are starting out with the ecosystem services assessment. So that's what we're doing. And there's an online platform, wittily named Opla. It was supposed to be a word that had no particular meaning, like Google. I don't know why, but that's what it's called. But the idea is that this will be a website, one-stop shop, that people can go to to get you know, details on case studies that are applying to ecosystem service approaches, details on the methods and how to use them, as well as access to experts such as <coughs> myself, um, who will be able to help them to use the tools in practice. So that's what's going on with openness uh, at the moment. So we're just, we're, yeah, currently those questionnaires are even being analysed and will be formulated into some guidance soon. So the take home messages from me, uh, ecosystem services encourages a wide view of, view of nature. It's that broad, that breadth that comes with ecosystem services, which is really helpful for arguing for why things are important, because they're not, it's not a matter of, um, I don't know, I don't want to call like a forest. It's like the, the forest is offering you so many more things than it would be if it was replaced by something else. Uh, and across a number of things, in terms, including sort of climate regulation, like bigger scale things that you wouldn't necessarily be thinking about if you were just thinking about timber. There are a lot of methods for looking at ecosystem services, and we're in the process of working out which ones are helpful in practice. There are methods out there to look at even difficult to get to ecosystem services. So things like cultural services have traditionally been avoided, they're not avoided, but been given less priority because they're hard to get to. You can't, there isn't a map of um, aesthetic beauty. There isn't a map of sense of place or cultural identity. They're quite difficult, abstract things to get across. Um, and I'm probably going to go to the next talk because we'll find out uh, ways of looking at it. I'm, I'm interested to see. Let's find out. Um, but it's one of those things. It, the, some of the methods we've used here, some of uh, have been able to get at some of those difficult bits. But then the question is, how do you combine those? How do you combine qualitative stories with data? in a way that gets the message across. When actually, quite often, it's the qualitative story that is, I mean, we're not building over Stonehenge because we like Stonehenge. <laughs> we're not building over it because it's ticks and boxes somewhere on some kind of uh, metric. So it's, it's how do you combine that kind of, I believe the existence of this is important with this one is giving me five million pounds worth of value. That kind of thing. How do we get those kind of decisions to be made? Back to the HBA. Um, I'm sorry there wasn't as much on that as there could have been but it's a fantastic asset and we would not have been able to do any of that work without it. So, I mean, I was, I, I'm so excited when I found it. I, it's just, no, but it is it's incredible to have there. And you've got such an asset, and from a research angle, I can see why lots of people would want to use it. Yep, lots of great stuff in Warwickshire, and it's clearly well valued by people. The um, photo series stuff shows that people do love the stuff you've got here. So maybe they need to be reminded of that every time they so, existing government and tools provide a better mechanism to argue for the protection of nature. Discuss. Anyway, thanks.